Hello and welcome to the New Hope online sermon for May 29, 2022, Memorial Day weekend. If you're traveling about, I hope you've tuned in for uh, the sermon here. Uh, be safe while you're traveling. Don't fall out of your boat. Don't burn yourself in a campfire. Uh, if you're just eating your way through Memorial Day weekend, then uh, don't eat too much, right? Uh, I'm going to try to record this from my back porch. The, the birds have been pretty tame here for a while, but you'll know if a cat walks through because they will start acting up. If a cat comes through, I might start acting up too. Uh, and the other thing I might mention is that I'm going to, my glasses are in car with my wife, and so I've got these glasses that were like two prescriptions ago, so um, hopefully I can read my way through through uh, the sermon today. Uh, sermon text is from Acts 16, beginning with verse 16. We were in the previous paragraphs last week, but starting with verse 16. Uh, once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. Uh, she followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. Uh, the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. Uh, after they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in, in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, the prison doors flung open, and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about ready to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. Uh, we're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fled, fell trembling before Paul and Silas. Uh, he then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then he spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour, at that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and his all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household the word of the Lord. Tomorrow is the federal holiday Memorial Day, of course, an occasion to remember military personnel who died in service to the country. Although the practice of decorating the graves of the fallen goes way back in history, uh, the American practice, as we know it, developed during and after the Civil War uh, Decoration Day, as it was originally called, seemed to have been more prominent in the South, but it quickly spread North. By the time of Lincoln's assassination, there were decoration ceremonies in many states. Over time, the fallen of other wars were included in grave decorating, 
1968, Congress passed the Uniform Monday Holiday Act, locating a national Memorial Day on the last Monday of May. If you ask most soldiers what is it that they are fighting for, or uh, what they're willing to risk their lives for, at or near the top of the list will be freedom. Freedom, they will say, is worth the sacrifice of life. Indeed, in America, freedom is the one thing that most everyone agrees upon. In our Declaration of Independence, uh, liberty is named as a God-given right. Political arguments uh, from either the left or the right will, will invariably appeal to freedom, uh, the right for people to choose for themselves, the right for people to speak and publish and tweet the way that they want, the right for individuals to pursue life without outside interference. America is an experiment in unprecedented civil liberty. And yet it's not hard to note the contradictions. Uh, there is widespread debt, and there's no freedom from creditors, right? Judging by all the security cameras and locks and firearms at bedside, we are not free of fear, certainly not free of anxiety. We are not free of our medicine cabinets. We are not, as a society, free from addiction, drugs, and alcohol, and porn. Uh, look around next time that you're at a restaurant, and you will see a world almost comically uh, enslaved by the cell phone. And this, the land of the free, has the highest incarceration rate in the world. Turns out there is freedom, and then there is freedom. Our New Testament reading from Acts today is in a lot of ways a meditation on the meaning of freedom. Uh, we're in Philippi again this morning, uh, where we get what amounts to a three-part reflection on freedom. Story number one. It is uh, another Saturday now, and Paul is headed to visit the Sabbath prayer group. That's where we were last week. And on the way, he bumps into a woman who is doubly enslaved. Socially, her status is that of a slave. She is the legal property of someone else. Spiritually, she is also possessed, uh, owned, uh, enslaved by a demon who enables her to tell fortunes. So we've got a possessed uh, female slave. And her presence raises all kinds of questions, right? Uh, tons of questions in this passage. At what point in her life did she become demon possessed? How did she end up a slave? And are the two of those things connected somehow? Uh, we, we know her owners took advantage of her commercially. Did they take advantage of her in other ways? Uh, the narration here is thin on detail. We don't really know. We just know that she is anything but free. But the text says she's been bugging Paul for several days as he's gone about his work, saying, uh, these are men of the Most High God telling you how to be saved. And I've got more questions there. Are, are her cries sarcastic or are they honest? Uh, we don't know. Uh, but why would a demon be pointing out the way of salvation? Just lots of questions. In his commentary on the book of Acts, F.F. F. Bruce says, uh, the missionaries did not appreciate her unsolicited testimonials. I like that. And the Acts narrator basically suggests that on this day, Paul got annoyed into casting the demon out of her. Uh, more questions 
for me on stuff like that. Uh, having encountered this girl before, had Paul been weighing the consequences of what an exorcism might mean, both for the girl and for Paul's ministry? Uh, the truth is we rarely know what's going on inside people's heads in Bible narratives. We only get to observe, and what we observe here is that on this day the demon is cast out. She is set free from that devil, at least, and uh, that's the end of freedom story number one, although with the lingering questions that persist. Story two, or maybe you think of it as uh, part two in the sequence of stories, but in, in this section, Paul and his buddy Silas end up incarcerated as a result of the slave girl incident. Uh, the business of exploitation can be lucrative, and uh, the money makers don't like it much, what Paul has done, and so uh, they drag Paul and Silas before a couple of magistrates. Uh, and the, the, the main uh, role of a magistrate was to keep the peace of Rome so that Caesar won't have to spend any extra energy looking out into these fringe provinces. Uh, and these outsiders are disrupting local business. It's, it's sort of a no-brainer to beat them and to toss them into prison. So this generous act of liberation on Paul's part ends, ends, ends in jail time. And we have that famous scene of Paul and Silas praying and singing their hymns in prison. By the way, why do we suppose, I, I have preached this way before, but I don't know why we would assume it. Why do we assume they were singing happy psalms, right? Half of the psalms, the Hebrew hymn book, half of them are lament or sad songs or complaint. Uh, Paul and Silas may very well have been singing uh, sad songs as their beaten backs ached and oozed. Uh, but what the prayers and the hymns do, though, is show that even if not completely happy in that moment, they understood that their lives were being caught up uh, in what God's doing in the world. Uh, they are servants of God. They are engaging in meaningful enterprise, uh, even if it's taken them to a bad place. And, and they are, in that sense, they are freer uh, than their captors. And of course, this part of the story ends with an earthquake that shakes Paul and Silas free, not only them, but everyone in jail. Uh, Most High God, it is clear in the story, is on the side of freedom. Part three, the earthquake wakes up the jailer who sees the prison doors flung open. He draws a sword to kill himself. He will do uh, the honorable thing here and self-punish, take himself out of the scene. Uh, just a momentary diversion here. It's interesting in Acts chapter 16 who gets named and who doesn't get named. Last week's wealthy merchant of purple is called by name Lydia. But this week we've got Slave girl, uh, no name there, and we probably shouldn't expect one. And in this part of the story, it is the jailer, Mr. Jailer, a guy known by job. Uh, he's a slave of sorts, isn't he? I mean, servant to his title, his niche in society, his, uh, servant to his reputation, uh, less a person than a cog in the machine, keeping things working. And what is uh, Mr. Jailer when he cannot serve his role? He's nothing. Well, he's got the knife drawn, but before he can commit his act of desperation, Paul says, no, look, we're all here. And the jailer falls before 
Paul and he asks, what must I do to be saved? Saved from what? I mean, more, more questions. Uh, uh, salvation is a rescue from something. What is it that holds this man? Is it a deep sense of personal sin? Is that what he needs to be rescued from? Or is it more the sense that his life is controlled by outside forces and that he's just a pawn in it all? Or is it very simply, what do I need to get delivered from the vulnerable spot that I'm in right now? I don't know, lots of questions. Uh, but Will Williman points out the odd shape of this uh, sequence of events in Philippi. By the end of the story, he writes, everyone who at first appeared to be free, the girl's owners, the judges, the jailer, all of those are slaves. And everyone who at first appeared to be enslaved, the poor girl, Paul and Silas, is free. I find this to be a thought-provoking scripture for a memorial weekend. Two of our big national holidays have to do with freedom, Memorial Day and barely more than a month from now, Independence Day, the 4th of, of July. And I would offer these observations for you to consider over this long weekend. First of all, I would remind you that the entire Bible, and not just Acts 16, is a lot about freedom. It is uh, about outside oppressors like Pharaoh and the Babylonians who seek to possess humans for their own gain, and how God wills freedom for his people. It is about individuals tangled in their own sin, like David, who, although a king, did not have the power to escape the dark web of death that he had helped create. And why does Jesus come to earth? A pretty good answer would be that he came to set people free. Jesus came announcing a kingdom of God, a kingdom of God's doing, in which the poor would be delivered from their poverty, prisoners would be set free, and the oppressed set loose from their oppressors. Jesus' miracles gestured the same. We have people set free from blindness and from every disability, people set free from demons, people delivered from guilt. And the promise is that when it's all said and done, we are freed from all that binds us. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain seems that we are caught up in a freedom story. My second observation, though, would be that uh, freedom in this world is complicated. I intentionally spoke of uh, sin as a web. Webs are hard to untangle. The more you try to break one, the more it gets stuck on you. Sin is a complicated web consisting of choices that we've made, choices others have uh, made, the, the, the consequences of which latch onto us. Uh, sin consists of demons acting in the world around us. Freeing people from the web can be complicated, and I think that's why this story raises so many questions. Uh, just take the complex case of the slave girl. Uh, she's doubly enslaved, slave to a demon, and caught up in that, that ancient and too durable institution of slavery. Uh, Paul has the power to free her from her demon, but is not uh, in control of the social forces that created slavery. Although, 
I think that the Paul's witness, especially in his letter to Philemon, is one of the things that begins to build the case against slavery. So I'm just saying the exorcism will work, but Paul is not in, in a position to free uh, the girl from those who own her. Plus, in freeing her from the demon without freeing her from her masters, that will cause problems of its own. Freedom, as I say, is a complicated thing in this world. My third observation is that, that freedom still seems like something that we're obligated to work toward. We are followers of Jesus, the great freedom giver, after all, and he calls us to share in his work. Although it will create a messy situation, Paul knows that freedom is worth dispensing in this story. Uh, and after some assessment, and I think that's one of the very interesting things uh, about this, this uh, passage, I think it does suggest that Paul had an opportunity across some days to think about what was happening to this girl. And after his deliberations, he finally decides to act. He offers her the freedom that he can give her. He can't fix the whole situation. Perhaps God will intervene in a different way through others or at least give her what she desires in eternity. But he acts, and it will cost him. But delivering freedom to others is worth whatever it costs us. And I think Christ's cross would be the symbol for that. A fourth observation, this one's sort of off to the side, but it's a, a bonus observation based on this story. Perhaps there are times when we sing our way to freedom. Chime in birds who are singing in the background to, to help make my point. Uh, our national story of freedom is based in a large part on self-defense and, and upon war. We fought our way to freedom, so that's how freedom comes. But freedom in today's story comes only in, in violence received. When the angry crowds come on Paul and Silas, they, they don't pull out their grenade launchers, nor, they, nor do they resort to holy kung fu. Uh, they become sufferers for the cause of freedom. They will bear the world's sin on their bodies. And then how is it that freedom is finally won in the story? Well, we are led to believe that the catalyst for freedom was their prayers and their songs. They sang their way out. Uh, I would think that something like that is impossible, except that it is basically the story of Estonia, and I can't help but think of Estonia whenever I read the story of Paul and Silas. Estonia is one of the small Baltic states in Eastern Europe, and after World War II, it was part of the Soviet bloc of control. Uh, but in the late 1980s, the Estonians got fed up with Soviet occupation of their country, and they decided they wanted it to end. But there was no people's uh, militia. All they had was their folk songs, the songs of who, who they were. And remember, that's what Paul and Silas are singing, too, in, in, a, in a sense. They're singing the songs that told that they were the children of God, songs of who they were. And so in Estonia, these concerts began to spring, spring up across the country, and thousands and thousands of people uh, attended. Uh, they sang in their folk songs, even when those songs were forbidden. I mean, what's an occupying power 
to, to do when everybody's doing the, the singing. You can't shoot or lock everybody up or else there's no economy, uh, no country to occupy. Uh, eventually, the Soviets realized they had no control. Uh, the tanks been, been, went back home and that uh, event has been called the singing revolution. No shots, just volleys of songs across the bow. The final observation would be this one. Because the entanglements of sin complicate things so much, it's perhaps unrealistic to think we're wise enough to completely fix things ourselves. For uh, uh, for one thing, uh, when when we fix one uh, moment, when we offer one moment of freedom, it seems like sometimes three more problems pop up. Something l like sin requires divine intervention, which is what we get at the end of the story. The world has been made a little bit better, we think, by Paul's act of mercy to the poor enslaved girl. But the real act of deliverance in this story is at the very end when Paul baptizes the jailer. Baptism is an act of liberation. It, uh, it frees us not in the coveted Western sense of absolute, unattached, personal independence. Uh, not that version of freedom. But oddly, the kind of freedom that comes in being made a servant of God, of the God who made us, uh, the God who knows what we were created to be, the God who loves us. While it is freedom from some things, it is uh, more appropriately freedom to something. It is freedom to become who we are. Through water, we die to the entanglements of this world and are born into the new kingdom where freedom reigns. Yes, we still uh, fight uh, freedom battles here where we are left, but in the confidence that freedom has already been won and that everything is moving toward that perfect liberation. Historically, baptismal season in the church was Easter, but maybe given all the attention to freedom the next few weeks, uh, June is a good baptism month to uh, our baptistry is ready to be filled. All we need now are some revolutionaries. All we need now are some freedom seekers. If that's on your mind, what you can do is uh, give me a call or shoot me a text or an email or, or talk to Eli or uh, any of the elders or you can follow me through town yelling, this man is a servant of most high God who is telling us the way to be saved. And, and chances are uh, that will get me annoyed enough to make sure that you get baptized. Amen. <laughs>